A very warm welcome to Reflections. This is our community devotional Bible study. Presently, we're in a series called Glad You Asked, often questions we may have. So our our question today is, what is the role of the Holy Spirit? If you have a a Bible, uh, please turn to John chapter 7. We'll look at a few verses from there. But there's no better way to begin our time together than that great hymn, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, Have Thine Own Way. Have Thine Own Way. Yes, fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only always living in me. Uh, We have a reading from John chapter 7. We're going to pick it up with verse 37 and read uh, a few verses there. As we ask the question, what is the role of the Holy Spirit? On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is a prophet. Others, Oh, he's the Christ. Still others asked, How can the Christ come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus, and some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. There was a four-engine jumbo jet plane, a 747. It was halfway across the Atlantic. They were going to London. The captain gets on the loudspeaker. Attention, we've lost one of our engines, but we can certainly reach London with the three we have left. Unfortunately, we will arrive an hour late as a result. Well, an hour later, the captain announced, Attention, we lost another engine. Still, we can travel on two. I'm afraid we'll arrive two hours late. Yes, an hour later. This is your captain. We lost our third engine. We will now arrive in London three hours late. Then one of the passengers became very angry and said, If we lose another engine, we'll be up here all night. 
Now, just as a jet plane needs engine power to fly, Christians need the power of the Holy Spirit to live the Christian life. Now, think about when Jesus was born, he was Emmanuel, God with us. When Jesus went to the cross, shed his blood for us, that was God for us, dying for us. But when we come to the work of the Holy Spirit, it reminds us that God is in us. And as Jesus said, the one who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And he said that in reference to the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the spirit had not yet been given Jesus was not yet glorified. <clears throat> what do you notice from the words of Jesus? Jesus didn't promise a trickle or a stream. He promised a river. You know, the Amazon River finds its origin from the freeze line of the Andy Mountains in South America. There, the little trickles of water emerge from the frozen ground and flow down the mountain. The river picks up speed and power for 36, for 3,600 miles, 3,600 miles before it reaches the Atlantic Ocean. And so it hits the ocean at a rate of 1.4 million gallons of water per second. That's a lot of force. And so with that force, it pushes fresh water from some 60 miles out into the Atlantic Ocean. Now, that's what I call power. And how like the Holy Spirit, who pushes us out in the world to be the salt and the light. It says no one can say Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. All who call on the name of the Lord because of the work of the Spirit will be saved. So let's explore that question. What is the role of the Holy Spirit? And our attention is first drawn What's the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament? We could call it the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant. Well, the Holy Spirit came upon certain individuals under the Old Covenant in the Old Testament. If you go all the way back to the book of Numbers, it says, The Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to him, and he took away some of the Spirit upon him and placed the Spirit on the 70 elders. And when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, yet they did not do it again. Isn't that interesting? The Spirit that was upon Moses to fill his call and destiny in God came upon 70 others for a purpose. When you look at the role of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon the Moses, the Joshua, the David, the prophets, so they could fulfill their role and calling God had for them. But now we come to the New Testament, a new covenant, a better covenant, a better way of doing things. And so we see the Holy Spirit indwells the believer. Paul said to the Corinthians, do you not know that you're a temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? Yes, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Now, before Jesus, God's Spirit dwelt in the tabernacle, but now he dwells inside his people. Paul went on to say to the Corinthians, Do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You're not your own. You've been bought with the price. Glorify God in your body. You know, the way we live should declare to the world that the Holy Spirit is present within us. You know, the world will learn about God based upon the way we live. That's a heavy responsibility, but also a holy charge. Now, think about it. If it's true the Spirit of God dwells in his people, and that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, then shouldn't there be a 
huge difference between the person who has the Spirit of God living on the inside and the person who does not have the Spirit of God living on the inside. Should there be a big difference? Absolutely. A resounding yes and amen. So you see that um, the issue isn't if we have the Holy Spirit, but how much of the Holy Spirit has us. And there's two ways the work of God's Spirit can be hindered in our lives. Paul said to the Ephesians, do not grieve the Holy Spirit whom you were sealed for redemption. The word grieve here makes to make sad or to sorry, and the context is unforgiveness. I don't know about you when you were growing up. Did you do something that grieved your parents that made them sad? Of course you did. Maybe we didn't listen to them or obey them. And so we grieved our parents. Well, because the Holy Spirit is God, God can be grieved or made sad as well. That's why it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit whom you were sealed for redemption. Paul went on to say to the church at Thessalonica, do not quench the Spirit. Quench means to put out a fire. When, when we ignore the Spirit by compromising our values and biblical convictions, one way not to grieve or quench the Spirit is having a forgiving Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. So uh, a foundation of living for Christ and the work of the Spirit is having a forgiving Spirit. That's a good indicator of uh, how not to hinder the work of God's Spirit in our life. No, Corey Tinboom tells a story from her own, own life. There was a church service in Munich that she saw a former SS man who had stood guard at the shower door in the processing center at Ravensbrück uh, concentration camp. He was the first of the actual jailers she had seen since that time. Suddenly it all came back, the room full of mocking people, the heaps of clothing. So this former SS guard came up to her as the church was emptying. He was kind of glowing. He bowed. He said, how grateful I was for your message. To think as you say, he has washed my sins away. And so he thrust out his hand to, to shake hers. And she said, I who had preached so often the need to forgive kept my hand at my side. Even as the anger, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, I saw the sin of them. Jesus died for this man. Was I going to ask for more? Jesus, forgive me, she said, and help me forgive him. She tried to smile. She struggled to raise her hand. She felt nothing, not the slightest spark of love or warmth or charity. She breathed up a silent prayer. Jesus, I cannot forgive. God, I need your help. I need your grace. Give me your forgiveness. And she said, and I quote, <clears throat> as I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder along my arm, and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him, while into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. I discovered it was not on our forgiveness or our goodness the world's healing hinges, but on Christ. When he tells us to love our enemy, he gives along with the command the love itself. I guess you could say, that was indeed the work of the Holy Spirit, empowering her with the grace of God, the fruit of the Spirit to, to practice the love of Christ, which in that moment was a forgiving spirit, a forgiving heart. As we're forgiven, we too can forgive 
because of the shed blood of Christ on the cross, because he rose for us. He conquered sin, death, and hell for us. And so the foundational truth is it's not if we have the Holy Spirit, but how much of the Holy Spirit has us. And that's the difference between the Old and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God was on certain individuals, like Samson, to defeat the enemy and take the jawbone and, and uh, conquer the enemy or uh, the lion or David the slingshot and, uh, against Goliath. The Holy Spirit was on people, but now the Holy Spirit is in us. We're the priesthood of all believers. The body of Christ has the Holy Spirit empowering it to be forgiving, to uh, uh, empower us with the fruit of the Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit enables us to live for Christ. Galatians says, if we live by the Spirit, let us follow or keep in step with the Spirit as well. That's a, a military term mean, meaning to march in a straight line, taking our orders only from him. And as we yield to the work of the Spirit, we'll experience his grace, his, the, his fruit, and people will take up and notice, why are they different from me or the rest of the world? There was a Father and son went to a small western town looking for an uncle they'd never seen. Suddenly the father points across the square. There goes my uncle. The son said, how do you know when you've not seen him before? The father said, son, I know him because he walks exactly like my father. See, if we live in the spirit, the world will know us by our walk because we're children of the heavenly father, loved forgiven. And so we, we have the character nature of our Father working in and through us. Paul went on to the Ephesians and said, do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Paul sets up a contrast. Don't be filled with alcohol or the things of this world. Don't be empowered by worldly things. Don't let the things of the world drive your life, but be filled instead with with the Holy Spirit. Let the things of God empower you. Let the things of heaven lead your life. See, the religious practices of the pagan worshipers involved excessive alcohol where people lost all control. You see, the word be filled is a command. It says, are you going to be filled with the world <coughs> or the word? World, word. Things of earth, things of heaven. What will we be influenced by? And this applies to all Christians, not just to select few. It means keep on being filled with the Spirit. Keep on being filled with the things of heaven. And this has nothing to do with contents or quantity as though we're like an empty vessel that needs a, a required amount of spiritual fuel to keep going. In other words, we're like a glove. The spirit is the hand. Without the hand, the glove cannot move. The glove cannot do anything by itself, but when the hand is in, in it, the glove can do many things. And so where the Christian is the glove, the glove follows the hand. So the spirit in us empowers us. Basically, without the spirit of God, we can do nothing. We're as ships without the wind, branches without sap, coal without fire. We're useless. Again, it's not if we have the Holy Spirit, but how much of the spirit has us. And so you say, well, chaplain, you mentioned forgiveness might be a good indicator that the Spirit of God has me and is working in me. That's true. What's some other evidence that the Spirit is empowering the life of the believer? Well, Paul went on to say in Ephesians 5, speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, sing and make melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks 
for all things. There's a, a couple other indicators that the Holy Spirit has us. One is gladness. Our lives are to be characterized by joy. You know, a singing heart is a joyful heart, isn't it? Uh, one of the uh, painters called Dave the Painter, every time I see him, he's always walking around our community singing Christian songs. The gladness and joy of the Lord is with him as he goes around painting and doing the calling that is upon his life. Reminds me of a, a woman brought her daughter a really nice baby grand piano for her birthday. So someone said, how, well, how, how's your daughter doing? The mother said, well, I persuaded her to switch to a clarinet. Why'd you do that? The mom said, well, with a clarinet, she can't sing. No, I reminded of one of the dear residents who used to be here. His name was Bob. He used to sing people to the other residents a happy birthday in assisted living and the care center. He loved to sing and he'd often come to the hymn sings, but because of his hearing loss, you know, he'd often sing off key and people would just smile. Oh, that's Bob. But Bob always had a big smile and gladness and the joy of Jesus Christ filled his heart. Um, so it's not about the key we sing in, but the heart. That's why it says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Now, obviously, you know, this isn't just in public worship, but the joy of the Lord permeates our life in the midst of all of life's challenges. You know, researchers have discovered that music stimulates auditory nerves, which influences muscle tone, equilibrium, or balance, joint flexibility. Uh, the human heartbeat is especially attuned to sound. As music changes in tempo and volume, it acts as a natural pacemaker. Our breathing slows down or speeds up along with the music. My dad was a disabled veteran from World War II. Um, there was uh, great challenges that come from being in the war, but he had listened to the sounds of the big band, which would keep him calm. You know, 15 minutes of music increases our the immune chemicals to protect us against disease and promote healing. For burn victims that were encouraged to sing while having their dressing changed, experienced less pain. Cancer patients saw levels of stress hormones drop and immune systems get stronger. Professor Richard Fradiani said, by helping patients relax, music eases pain and speeds recovery. It has a direct effect on the function of the brain. So in the secular world, they would call that music therapy. Our God calls it speaking to one another in hymns, making, uh, singing and making melody in our heart to the Lord. And God thought of it first. And so all the blessings of worship, all the blessings of singing to the Lord are part of his gift of grace to us. And if all those blessings work in the secular world without God in the center, imagine when Jesus is, is in the center, how much more the blessing is in our life. And so a, a gladness and worship and joy in a heart is a good indicator of the Spirit of God working in your life. Another one is gratitude. Sometimes giving thanks to the Lord. Occasionally giving thanks. When I feel like giving thanks, no, it says always giving thanks. There's no time or situation when we should not give thanks. There was an elderly couple who sat next to a pastor on a plane. The wife said, oh, I don't like riding on these airplanes. Folks get on them with guns and knives and they take you to places you don't want to go. Well, the plane lands and the husband said, see, we made it. And his wife said, 
Yeah, but we're not there yet. See, if you were to fall down and break your leg, you wouldn't thank God for the broken leg, but you would thank God for his grace, which will enable you to handle having a broken leg. Whatever the circumstances are, we can always find something for which to give God praise and thanksgiving. A man by the name of Jack was on a short mission trip to the island of Tobago. Tobago. He was leading worship at a leper colony, and there was time for one more song. So he asked for a request when a woman who had been facing away from the, the pulpit turned around, and it was the most hideous face he had ever seen. Her nose and ears were entirely gone. The disease had destroyed her lips as well, and she lifted a fingerless hand in the air and said, can we sing, count your many blessings? Well, overcome with emotion, this uh, Jack left the service. A team member said, I guess you'll never be able to sing that song again. He said, yes, I will, but never the same way. Is our heart filled with gladness and gratitude? Do we count our blessings or our crosses more? Are we filled with gladness and gratitude is a good indicator how much of the Spirit has us. Again, it's not if we have the Holy Spirit, but how much of the Holy Spirit has you. In the 1968 Olympics in Mexico, the Tanzania Marathon representative, John Akwari, he fell. He suffered a serious leg injuries after 18 miles. Race officials urged him to quit, but he refused. He collapsed on the finish line more than an hour after the winner had finished. When asked why he didn't quit, he said, my country did not send me to start the race, but to finish it. Lord, thank you that the Holy Spirit as we've been baptized in Christ, we have the Spirit of God. And it's the Spirit of God that empowers us to finish the race. That's why we keep on running. That's why we keep on living one day at a time. With the forgiveness of God, with the gladness and gratitude of God in our heart. How can you put a smile on someone's face this week? Just a uh, Tell somebody, you know, I appreciate you. I'm praying for you. Give them a big smile. Let's uh, close once again with Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Have thine own way. May the grace of God fill you with his spirit till only Christ is seen in us. May he fill your life with gladness and gratitude till we meet again.